by Commissioner Haggerty and uh, Mayor Elam, I prepared something to read. Uh, this is a pretty sensitive issue. Um, I want to clarify something from the city attorney, if I could. The standard that we were advised to use to make a recommendation or to make a decision, uh, I think you, we used that, that term three times the night of that meeting. It was the reasonable person standard. Is that correct? I will say also the city attorney has had Larry out as well. Past week of it. In section one, section one ten of the ethics ordinance, in paragraph three, uh, this section of the ordinance concerns the complaint and the procedure for handling the complaint. Um, it provides in paragraph three that the interpretation that a reasonable person in the circumstances apply. <coughs> shall be used in interpreting and enforcing this code of ethics. Thank you. The second question, I would like to know what are the, I mean obviously we know what the legal remedies are, but the non-legal remedies um, for us to make a decision and, and what kind of a statement can we make here tonight? What are the parameters, the guidelines? The ethics ordinance provides the procedure for the handling of complaints. Uh, when a complaint is lodged against a member of the Board of Commissioners, the, the Board has uh, three options. Uh, to determine either A, that the complaint has merit, B, determine that the complaint does not have merit, or C, determine that the complaint has sufficient merit to warrant further investigation. If, uh, if the board determines that the complaint has merit, the ethics complaint has merit, then that prompts you to paragraph 4 of section 110 of the ethics ordinance, which provides that uh, when a violation of this code of ethics also constitutes a violation of a personnel, I'm sorry, that's not the right section. I'm sorry, 111, section 111 of the ethics ordinance specifically concerns violations. An elected official or appointed member of a separate municipal board, commission, committee, authority, corporation, or other instrumentality who violates any provision of this chapter is subject to punishment as provided by the municipality's charter or other applicable law and in addition is subject to censure by the governing body. An appointed official or an employee who violates any provision of this chapter is subject to disciplinary action. <coughs> Could you define censure? Um, censure is, uh, if, if under Section 111 of the Ethics Ordinance, you conclude that this ordinance was violated, you have um, the option of censure, which is a public reprimand, <laughs> or the um, removal provisions of the city charter or there are additional ouster provisions in state law. So those, if you find that there's a violation, those are three remedies that are available to you. All right, just one <coughs> regular statement that we can go from there. <coughs> in her investigative report, Attorney Flowers found limited factual basis to the legality of the mayor's waste actions. And I don't find the mayor's actions reach the level that I feel that this should be sent to a higher authority for investigation. The allegations and limited facts that have come out of this investigation do not rise to the level that would lead to any action on this commission to the degree of removal or ouster proceedings. There are, however, issues that have been raised that greatly concern me. We requested the city attorney, Paul Flowers, perform a function that by the nature of her occupation would be difficult for her as attorneys deal in fact and in ordinances, provable items are the only basis for a recommendation they can make and therefore the burden of proof becomes different than the burden that we were actually instructed to operate under. So there is a little bit of a conflict. 
the city employees and the people of Mount Juliet deserve for this to be fixed, but they also deserve for the outcome to be one that will allow this city to continue to grow and evolve into a positive place to live and work. I read Attorney Flowers' report very carefully and followed up by reading the statements made by the individuals interviewed. In the first item, on page 3, section 2, I noted that Hatton Wright was not the author of this complaint. It was noted that Rob Shearer had written the complaint. And I will say that much like another complaint recently filed, this complaint makes allegations that are not known to be fact, but contain what others have heard and what others think. Therefore, the author of this complaint does not make the complaint more or less credible. It really didn't weigh in. Mr. Wright's complaint states that the mayor used her position and sought by threats and intimidation directed towards the zoning administrator to kill an anticipated condition or requirement of the Mount Juliet crossing being developed by her employer. After reading the statements, a reasonable person would believe that the mayor was indeed using her position to lobby on behalf of her employer. Statements made by Mr. Franklin would indicate that he didn't know that she was an employee of CRS, and then another statement later uh, uh, made by then city manager Rob Shearer would indicate that they both knew at the, phone, at the time of the phone call that she was an employee. Her statement further confirmed when she said that she engaged the services of attorney Tom White on behalf of CRS. The only two people who have first-hand knowledge of what happened, it would seem, are Bobby Franklin and Linda Elam. While the facts on this complaint may limit a legal conclusion, they do not limit a conclusion based on what a reasonable person would assume. The mayor was an employee of CRS, <coughs> excuse me, as well as an elected official of the city, and any phone call made on behalf of CRS is improper and is not acceptable behavior under any circumstances. The complaint states, or continues, and states the mayor used a position in an attempt to secure special consideration for Pulte Homes to be allowed to make a, uh, begin construction of new homes in the Dale Webb subdivision before their infrastructure was complete, contrary to the city's ordinances and policies. The city's codes prohibit a developer from building before completion of a substantial portion of the infrastructure. And to my knowledge, it's the only way that's a condition of the Planning Commission with a bond being issued by the developer to ensure the completion of that infrastructure. While the meeting itself was not improper, the request may have been ill-advised, may have been lacking good judgment, especially for the former chair of the Planning Commission. Although all of us have meetings with developers trying to correct contentious items that work with staff trying to obtain the best product for future residents, we shouldn't use a tone or conduct ourselves in a manner that would lead anyone to feel intimidated by our presence. We should also keep in mind who we represent, and that is the interest of the residents presently in this city and the residents yet to move into our city, not the interest of developers who will move, soon be moving out of our city. I did find it interesting that one individual in the depositions, a professional with a very clear, keen recollection for detail, would have to be reminded that he even attended this meeting. This would lead a person to believe that this professional was concerned about his future professional relationship with the city if he recalled details that might appear harmful to those involved. However, all of this being said, I did not find that this issue is to have any standing and did not feel that a reasonable person would believe Mayor Elam to be acting outside of the accepted boundaries. I will also say that I believe that Mayor Elam's demeanor was born of frustration because I, like others at this table, have experienced that frustration and I'm just realizing uh, tenuous situation we place staff in when we exhibit our feelings openly. The complaint also refers to a matter involving Mount Juliet Commons First Freedom Bank and was probably the easiest to address because it has been my district and most of the circumstances were addressed while at either the Planning Commission or the City Commission level. It was handled properly. Given the City Attorney's report and the accompanying statements, first-hand knowledge, notes on file addressing conditions, ordinances governing the zoning, there is nothing that would lead any reasonable person to believe or even perceive that, is, that an improper circumstance exists. Uh, actually, just seems to be another indication of the frustration on the part of elected officials sometimes in how our process works. 